From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Toby O'Brien, Johnny. Heard you had a run-in with Sheriff Doherty. They say you gave him a little sundown to resign his office. Yeah, I don't think he will, though. He'll have to do something close to it. I got some information on Richard Hobb, the building inspector who was murdered. Yeah? Hobb deposited $20,000 in the bank last year. What's that? Now, wait. Hobb's salary as city building inspector was $7,500 per annum. The $20,000 went in in four $5,000 deposits. Holy... And now, wait. There's more. Those deposit dates coincide with OKs Hobb made on the school building. He was paid off after each inspection. Johnny, we got it on paper. We got some other things on paper, too, Toby. Hold on. Keep digging. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Clinton, Colorado. To United Adjustment Bureau, 418 West 61st Street, New York City. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Clinton matter. Expense account item 15, $45. For photostatic copies of deposit slips in the account of Richard Hobb, building inspector, lately murdered. Furnished by one of my operatives, Toby O'Brien. Here you are. Okay. I got a feeling this whole town's coming apart at the seams, Johnny. The sheriff threatened you openly. Everybody who's anybody around here is trying to cover up the school burning down and the way it was built. I think I can hurry up the process. Uh, you be careful. These people seem to play for keeps. They've got to realize we do, too. These photostats are the first real bit of presentable evidence that the building was constructed under fraudulent circumstances. Hey, take it easy. Now, you keep the originals. Mail them out to the office. The post office is still pretty honest. Yeah. Also, let it out that we have the information, wherever you go. I want them to get worried and steamed up and start acting dumber than they already have been. Okay, might scare Doherty and Hanley a little bit. That Vickery seems like a different proposition. I don't think he scares. I drove my rented car over to the home of his grieving widow. She answered the door with tears in both eyes and bourbon over the rocks in one hand. She wore a black dress, black and satin and tight, low cut. Not exactly Emily Post for mourning. But as I say, it was black. A black lace handkerchief waved in the air. Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm glad you came by. I'm so unhappy and lost. Yeah, I can see that. May I come in? Why not? The sheriff hasn't done anything about Thought Richard's murder. I wouldn't rely too heavily on Sheriff Doherty, Mrs. Hobb. I don't think he will do anything. No. Well, don't look so surprised in your hour of bereavement, Mrs. Hobb. You know he won't do anything. I don't know anything of the kind. Why don't you sit down and let's talk? I want you to help me. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I can help you. I'm, I'm so broken up. Oh, now, if you're not careful, you might drown in those tears. What are you trying Relax, to... Relax, Mrs. Hobb. All right. So I can't really cry about Richard. I never have. But I thought it was expected of me. Some people might expect it. I don't. Now, look... This set of creaks from top to bottom. Your late husband made $7,500 a year and deposited $20,000 in six months. Here. Figure. I don't know anything about his money. All I know is the bank told me he had only $300 left. What did he do with it? What do you think? He spent it on other women. Then why the tragic act? I'm not very good at it, am I? Not the best. And it's funny, Johnny, because I really mean it. Oh, I know how foolish I look in these clothes. I wanted to cry because, well, I really loved him once, and he loved me, but we kicked it away because we both wanted more excitement than this town or his salary could give us. He was always out spending his money on other women, being a big shot. What about the money? He got it for falsifying the inspection papers, didn't he? Yes. Who gave it to him, Mrs. Hobb? I don't know. Probably Roy Vickery. Who do you think killed him? I don't know that either. What do you know? Johnny, he didn't believe insurance. And I have to live the best way I can. If I stay in this town, I have to keep friends. If I don't want to keep them, I have no choice but to move. And that takes money. I wonder what could possibly be going on in your mind. Your company handles insurance, doesn't it? 263 different kinds. Are you particular what kind of premiums you collect? Well, we pay off on a lot of things. 
Just what kind of insurance were you thinking about? $2,000 endowment. Got your pen? No, but my words go to the cashier's cage. What do you got? I'm trusting you. Richard got that $20,000 from the Clinton Gravel Company for services rendered. Know who owns the Clinton Gravel Company? Roy Vickery. That's close enough. Last night after you were here, Richard came back. I told him what you'd said to me. He said Vickery and the others were going to make a patsy out of him. So he left to see you. And got shot up. Hey, wait, wait a minute. Vickery was outside your house when I left. He might have done it himself. That's all I can tell you. Now, uh, do I get my insurance? If what you say is true, Mrs. Hobb, I'll have to check first. Well, you'll find out. Say, where do you come from, anyhow? Hartford, Connecticut. Connecticut. Say, I got an idea. What's the housing situation in Hartford? Rough. For you, Mrs. Hobb. Very rough. <laughs> I finally tore myself away from the grieving widow and headed back for the hotel. On my way down the main street of Clinton, someone with a wrinkled coat and bourbon on his breath stepped out and stopped me. David Baines, the architect. Dollar. Well, hi. I told you I was going to stick around and do something brave. Oh? I finally got up courage enough to do something decent. Decent for me, anyway. For anybody else, it'd be too low to talk about. Well, what was it? Well, I'm not much of a lawyer, but they say there's a statute in the books that says a private citizen may commit a crime to prevent a greater crime from being committed and still go free. Is that right? I wouldn't know. Well, I committed a crime. Two crimes. Dishonor to my noble character, disappointing the trust of a young woman. That was the first one. Then, uh, then engineering a theft. I'm a fagin. That's what I am. Under the guise of loving a young female secretary eternally, I have, well, here. The purchase orders from Roy Vickery's office. The actual purchase orders for the school. What? She stole them for me. For you. With my best regard. I looked at them. They were as advertised. Purchase orders complete down to the last tenpenny nail. Expense account item 16, 48 cents, postage. Not being a technical expert, I sent them down to Denver for perusal by the original brokers. Fourteen hours later, the verdict came back in a long telegram. The materials used in the school construction were not passable. The insurance company would never honor the claim of the city of Clinton. This text I turned over to Frank Ibsen, publisher of the Clinton Times. He promised it would be in the late afternoon edition. There were other developments. Toby O'Brien again. Yeah, Toby. We located two witnesses to the Hobbs shooting. Vickery put Hobb out of the way himself. Get their statements and get them on a train to Denver right away. Right. Then you better gather up the rest of the boys and come over here. Right. Expense account item 17, 10 cents, one newspaper. The afternoon edition of the Times, which carried a complete story of the insurance investigation up to date, naming Vickery as the perpetrator of the school fire and involving Sheriff Doherty and Chief Hanley. I phoned Frank Ibsen and explained his next edition could carry the story of Hobbs' murder by Vickery. Ibsen said he'd make up an extra for that. I'd no sooner hung up the phone than I had visitors. Want to come with us, Dollar? Not particularly. Who are you? Deputy Egan. Sheriff Doherty wants to talk to you. I've already said all I want to say to him. Get out. Guys? Oh, no. Take him out of here. There was strictly no contest. I walked out of the room with a deputy on each side of me and Egan behind me. We were in front of the hotel when I saw Toby O'Brien, Al Davis, and John Newton coming toward the entrance. I kicked out at the nearest man and yelled for help. A few of the local citizens joined in the fight, and Sheriff Doherty's three deputies got the worst of it. We took them all back up to my room. Now, sit down. All right, Egan. You're you're going to be arrested for this, Dollar. Where were you going to take me? Where? Place on the edge of town. Clinton Gravel Works. Why? Doherty, Doherty said to bring you back. He, he wanted to see you. Who's there with him? I, I don't know. The Clinton Gravel Works was a large building and tall shaft set on the edge of a frozen lake. Parked near the entrance was a long black limousine, such as a well-to-do contractor might drive. A white supercharged sedan, such as a fancy western sheriff might use, and a red sedan, unmistakably belonging to the fire chief. We covered all the exits, and Toby O'Brien and I went in the front way. We were halfway up the steps when things began to happen. You all right? Yeah, come on. Wow. Hello, 
a dollar. <laughs> All right, lie still, Vickery. I stayed still for you too long. I should have put you out of the way. The same as you put Hob out of the way. Better. Ah, <coughs> uh, this one's gone. Who is he? Fire Chief Hanley. Vickery, where's Doherty? He's out shooting his gun some more, Dollar. I hope he gets you too. I hope. He's backstairs, Johnny. Yeah. Stay away from me, Dollar. The place is surrounded. Throw down the gun and walk out with your hands behind your head. Toby, I'll get down the front way. Get the guys to step around through the shaft. Right. You coming out? Doherty, you coming out? No. Doherty. You ought to go over a place good before you think you got a man trapped, Dollar. You're trapped, Sheriff. The men are waiting for you. I'm up here with you, and you're the one I want. I told you I'd kill you. I've still got my gun in my hand. Vickery had his gun, and so did Hanley. Look at them. Yeah, you did pretty well. Made it look like they shot each other. And now it's your turn, Dollar. No! Get back! Okay, Johnny? Yeah, just a nick. Hey, get a doctor, will you? Yeah, sure. Well, Sheriff? Uh... I guess, I guess I kind of forgot something. Yeah, what's that? The part about, about the falling out among thieves, Dollar. That was Sheriff Doherty's last statement. He died on his way to the hospital. Roy Vickery recovered and was arraigned on charges of murder, conspiracy, 28 counts all told. Chief Hanley was dead. Expense account, item 18, $62, board and room. Item 19, $58, miscellaneous. Item 20, $164, transportation back to Hartford. Total expense account, $2,385.03. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's exciting story. Next week, the Jolly Roger fraud matter. And, uh, yeah, that means piracy. Of a kind that would have made Captain Kidd look like a bungling amateur. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Jeanette Nolan, Lucille Meredith, Carlton Young, Herb Ellis, Jack Petruzzi, Bob Bruce, Herb Butterfield, Paul Richards, Edgar Barrier, Russell Thorson, Jack Moyles, and Frank Gerstle. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs>